I had the pleasure to work here already uh, in the Neem Art Center in 2014 when I did a project in collaboration with uh, the artist and activist and uh, uh, teacher Gregory Cholet titled uh, It's the Political Economy Stupid. I also show uh, an uh, image of the front cover of a book we did in Pluto Press uh, together because the design of the book is actually here. It's Noel Douglas and he's also one of the artists in the show Flat Tide of uh, Resistance. And, uh, in this exhibition that deals with uh, how artists responded to the financial and economic crisis uh, in 2008 and afterwards, uh, Noel developed a very interesting uh, design uh, using these boom and bust cycles of our economy uh, as an inspiration uh, that uh, leads to certain uh, yeah, arrows and, and lines uh, that remind on the graphs of uh, stock exchanges. And um, I'm an artist and filmmaker, and in the past few years, I focused a lot on climate breakdown. I worked on a cycle of films uh, on mass civil disobedience in relation to the climate crisis. Uh, so these are installation shots uh, from an exhibition that's still ongoing in the Tallinn Art Hall. Uh, and this is the work, everything's coming together while everything's falling apart, uh, that was carried out between 2015 and 2020. And each of these films you see here focuses on one specific event, like here, for example, the blockade of Europe's second largest coal harbor that's located in Amsterdam uh, in 2017, and that's the blockade of an open pit coal mine in North Bohemia in the Czech Republic in 2018, uh, and the blockade of uh, the red carpet of the Venice Film Festival in 2019, where it was occupied for eight hours by a few hundred climate activists. And I could go on and go on, but that's now really the theme uh, for this talk. Um, so the exhibition here focuses on artists and art workers who consider themselves to be part of the climate justice movement and produce art kind of related to it. And when you go here through the exhibition and see uh, these works, you will actually see many different ways of how artists are relating each other to it. And I'm sure there are plenty more than the ones I chose for this exhibition. And uh, this is a film um, I did actually as an artist. And here in the exhibition, it can be regarded as a uh, kind of curatorial extension. It includes nine um, um, uh, art artists who are part of the movement, who are central protagonists of the movement, who come from different generations and also from different backgrounds. They also have quite different uh, ways of how to work in the movement. And I brought them together in a studio setting and in this 38 minute long film, Barricade Cultures of the Future, you see these guys talking about uh, the relation between art and activism uh, and the necessity for the two artists uh, within the movement and why. And, um, and several of these artists are also here in the exhibition. So um, we see here on the left uh, Akani Diana. Uh, she's one of the two indigenous artists of the media you can uh, find uh, uh, in, in the basement in the, in the room. Uh, it's this film Arise, uh, the shortest, probably the most poetic uh, film in the exhibition. Uh, in the middle, we have Steve uh, Lyons uh, from uh, the um, 
actually, usually you see it behind the projection, that's why I was a bit irritated and on these two monitors, so it's the natural it's history museum. Uh, and then we have uh, Jay Jordan on the right, uh, who is part of the laboratory of insurrectionary imagination. So, as we just opened this exhibition um, yesterday, and we have not uh, real installation shots, uh, and my talks actually to kind of give something like a tour through the exhibition, uh, to also tell you uh, maybe a few things you cannot uh, find in the in the reader. Um, I actually use uh, installation shots from the show uh, how it was uh, installed in the exhibition in uh, Vienna, uh, which was the third iteration uh, when we still use the title Overground Resistance. And here for this exhibition in Venice, due to this extension towards the sea, we also use the new title for Latite of uh, Resistance. So here we have Jonas Starr's work, which you usually can uh, watch here, which I installed at the entrance, and it's also um, more or less at, in the entrance area. Here, just because I think it, it gives a quite a good introduction uh, in how you could um, um, define discourses we have about uh, climate hegemonic discourses as a form of propaganda. And most interesting for me in this aspect uh, or in relation to this exhibition uh, is the first one, it's the liberal climate propaganda, which is actually uh, what we hear all the time from media and from uh, in political discourses, uh, which sees the problem with, um, with global warming uh, as, uh, as a problem of consumption. So if it's bad consumers um, driving too much with the plane or with their cars, eating too much meat, uh, using too much plastic, uh, and uh, having their apartments too warm in, in winter with, uh, with uh, heated by fossil fuels. Uh, actually, things are a bit more complicated, and I think there are several shows in this, ex several pieces in this show pointing towards that. Uh, that um, I think there is a systemic problem that leads towards climate breakdown, and this is something that's uh, related to uh, how uh, capitalism works and uh, how it also. Um, does not leave a step up space to do something without more or less uh, destroying uh, the environment in, in which we are living. So, artists need to create on the same scale that society has the capacity to destroy. Uh, a, a text, uh, uh, Lauren Baum at the Metabolic Studio uh, in LA used a lot. Uh, for their work uh, in, in different contexts uh, and here of course it also has the function already at the entrance to kind of make clear for maybe an audience that is not pre-informed of what to expect in this exhibition um, that this is not about beautiful, beautiful objects or aesthetic experiences or whatever or some uh, personal artistic expressions, but this is really, uh, yeah, about uh, how artists actively try to prevent the further destruction of of our livelihood uh, in different ways. So that's. The film we can find here in the basement by the uh, artist Giallo de Aragao, artist and filmmaker, uh, a Brazilian filmmaker, and he's focusing on, um, on indigenous resistance against destruction of the livelihood of the Amazon rainforest. And 
uh, on the one hand, we see uh, an action of civil disobedience uh, in front of uh, this national assembly in Brazil, uh, in Brasilia, but also um, we follow a group of indigenous activists uh, when they uh, listen to uh, to members in the National Assembly more or less uh, discussing uh, privatization of this territory and uh, uh, further extractive uh, projects. So you can also see this, uh, this difference between uh, predominantly uh, white men in their 50s or 60s uh, wearing business dresses and uh, indigenous activists who do not even have a seat there and can uh, on the same level bring forward their, uh, their wishes and, uh, and uh, their political agenda, but uh, they, yeah, they have no representation there. And I think that's um, brought to us in a very uh, good way to this, uh, to this film. Uh, right of it, uh, we see here um, works by the activist and also artist Sede, uh, who um, is interested in abstract painting in, in Jackson Pollock, for example. And he did a cycle of works in the past 10 or 15 years uh, with different um, uh, trip paintings where huge amounts of, of paint were, uh, were put on a certain uh, material. And the particular about this practice is that he's always using banks in France as the basis of his artistic work, so it's not the studio practice, but more practice in public space. Um, and yeah, he seems to be very good also in hiding his identity because uh, he still can keep up with this important work. And in the context of this exhibition, he of course points to uh, main funders of climate breakdown because all these extractive projects uh, they, they could never be funded without banks uh, supplying the, uh, the needed billions of euros and, and US dollars and uh, so therefore it's also really necessary to point out this, uh, this awful roles banks are playing um, that's an uh, artist, it's a Dakota artist in uh, Dakota. And uh, it's Gilbert King's really enemy, the third. And he participated in these uh, protests against the Dakota Excess uh, Pipeline, where a new pipeline for, uh, for uh, terror sounds. Uh, uh, would have crossed indigenous territories and several major rivers and, uh, and would have potentially endangered the uh, water of millions of people, not only indigenous uh, people. And so there were uh, protests that were also quite a bit uh, in, in, in hegemonic media. When was it? Two thousand. 16, 16, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and Gilbert uh, has a very interesting practice because we see a variety of different styles, more or less. Um, these are graphics that are being used also in, in activism. Some are more like direct with uh, a bit of text and uh, images you can immediately understand, and others are something, they go much more into detail and they're something to explore. Um, and you, you find a lot of this, um, this uh, subject uh, of the snake, which also has some importance in the uh, indigenous mythology. Uh, but uh, in this case, also the pipeline can be regarded as a kind of snake, a black snake. 
and this black snake or those people who try to build this black snake they yeah are, are being seen as the enemy you, you have to fight and this work is also kind of the visualization uh, and it's it's graphics that's also being used in the in the fight so it's important that it's not only work about but it's also work that is directly connected to the strike and here in the background we see this inflatable uh, we have here in the entrance very nicely installed uh, when you come up the street you can see this already like uh, 100 meters uh, uh, away that's a piece by uh, tools for action uh, it's a collective around uh, Bambi Van Barn, an um, artist activist uh, based in Rotterdam. And it's um, this particular uh, cube has been used uh, in the demonstrations against the COP21 in Paris in December 2015. And, uh, yeah, that was a very particular moment when uh, there was a ban of demonstrations because uh, just a few weeks prior to uh, the COP21 uh, there was this attack on this nightclub and while uh, uh, shopping malls and Christmas markets could still uh, be open, uh, the authorities announced that ban of uh, demonstrations and political assemblies and uh, that's how it's going and, and these cubes are being used um, on the one hand in more quiet and energetic moments in the demonstrations they can be thrown up and they are being used a bit like balls but um, uh, in the case of the confrontation with the police, this is also an object that can be put uh, uh, in order to protect bodies. Uh, it can be put between attacking police and um, activists. And there is also uh, a poster you can you can take with you, and this poster. On, on the back, it, uh, it has actually a manual of how to produce this, so it's open source and you could choose your own one for your own uh, participation in an upcoming demonstration in Cyprus or elsewhere. Um, really amazing work uh, and I'm fascinated by this already for many, many years is the work J. Jordan and Isabel Camus do in the framework of uh, Institute uh, or lab Laboratory of uh, Insurrectionary Imagination. And uh, so in this particular film, which is also installed downstairs, so the video works are predominantly installed downstairs. Uh, this is a film in particular about the, uh, the construction of uh, of a, of a tower uh, for for the for the Zad. and the Zad is the largest occupied territory in Europe that emerged of, from an um, from an occupation in a fight against the building of the new airport for the city of Nantes in, in France. So there's a decade-long resistance against this airport and. Uh, uh, were occupations of the territory, we cleared it, there were reoccupations. And uh, yeah, so th this film is about a lighthouse that could be seen uh, also as an artwork, I think. Uh, in, in any case, uh, it's something that has a, a function in this place there. Uh, so it, it could be used to raise alarm in a case of an emergency when police is coming. Uh, but it's also being used uh, as a platform for concerts uh, taking place. So when I visited uh, the Tzad, there was a nice concert taking place uh, on the stairs uh, leading up to the lighthouse. Um, 
but it's also the location of where uh, that was chosen for this lighthouse is exactly the same location that was chosen originally in the plans of the airport for the tower. So that's also an idea to replace this uh, necessary infrastructure of a larger infrastructure and airport uh, that, uh, that facilitates climate breakdown uh, and to, um, to uh, replace it for something that can be used for different things. And the film downstairs, I really encourage you to take the half an hour and check it out. It's, uh, it's not only also a documentation, as I think none of the works here are documentaries, uh, even though they work with documentary formats, uh, but there's also uh, um, an, an, uh, a part, the end of it, that's kind of an outlook into the future. And the future will necessarily or obviously see rising sea levels. And uh, so they just imagine that these rising sea levels might lead towards certain parts of France become isolated from the rest of France. And due to the rising sea levels, maybe an island could develop and the lighthouse would finally, maybe at the end of the century, get back the original function and lighthouse. Has. Um, yes, it's a beautiful story. I like it. We see here in the back uh, Noel's work. I won't talk about this because Noel will talk about his work afterwards himself. Um, I need to speed up a bit. So, this is um, the, uh, a film by. These two indigenous artists, Akanidiana and Katie Krishna Chetnil. And uh, so they bring together both their perspectives from uh, indigenous poets, one living in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific, and uh, the other living in Greenland. In Greenland, where the ice is melting, leading to a local ecological catastrophe but on a global level leads to a massive rise of sea levels and to the disappearance of the Marshall Islands uh, over the, probably in the next few decades uh, if, uh, if carbon emissions are not really stopped in a, in a radical manner. And they, they wrote a poem uh, and did a film uh, uh, in this uh, collaborative uh, piece. So in the exhibition um, in uh, Vienna, we also had many tours, and among them, the tour I liked the most. Uh, so that was the time when the Zapatistas were in their, uh, had their European tour. And so uh, they also uh, came to the exhibition, and uh, we had an exchange there. So we had a, a Spanish translator, and uh, yeah, I was, talking about the exhibition to them and they were talking about their experiences and, and it was really very beautiful and inspiring. So here they are standing in front uh, of Rachel Schrebe's work, which we also see here installed in the entrance uh, region. And Rachel Schrebe's uh, focus is on the People's Climate March that took place in 2014 in, in New York. And at that time, uh, that was the largest mobilization in relation to climate in the history. And uh, Rachel was one of the many organizers in the background that tried to inform um, underprivileged youth and other people about uh, global warming and also the necessity to stand up and fight for a future. And uh, she did uh, workshops over several years, uh, several months, and uh, of course had many um, inspiration through through that. Uh, and, she, and, she, and she used um, some of the ideas. So there are many texts in it, uh, and and brings it offers it to us to maybe learn from some of the conversations she had and uh, 
yeah, LSC post its uh, machine use. So we try here not to exceed uh, 20 or 25 minutes, and as my 20 minutes are coming nearly to an end, maybe I, I finish with uh, this piece by the National History Museum, uh, which I also really consider uh, a really important one uh, because it also shows how uh, an artistic work can also exist into establishing relationships to, for example, working class organizations or indigenous peoples. And uh, so this work in particular is focusing on Houston in the US, the largest refinery, uh, which is actually located in an area where also many people live. And um, as you probably might assume, the majority of them is black or often or Hispanic. And uh, so there's a high cancer rate. Uh, so they work together with these uh, communities and try to organize uh, and mobilize people. And there's also one other interesting aspect. Uh, there's also a local museum. And this museum, a museum of natural history, that museum is funded by the same petroleum corporations that here destroy the livelihood of the local people while destroying yeah, the livelihood on a global manner through their contribution uh, to carbon emissions and methane emissions. And, and they also uh, change somehow what's being presented in museums when you talk, for example, about what they label probably climate change, and I prefer to describe it as climate breakdown. Um, yeah, so it's interesting work also to check out after the day because the day is not installed. Yes, but I should not forget that we here have the uh, extension um, with uh, Dio Pocomidis, so uh, an artist from Athens, he is also here and maybe he will involve later on uh, in the discussion. He um, focuses on uh, ecological resistance uh, in Greece in uh, work that focuses uh, or, or also or in one aspect also is kind of a portrait of one of the, uh, of the activists who is a German actor. So it's a multi-layered uh, work. I also really recommend to check it out. And we have uh, Ana de Diaz uh, She is an artist uh, from Spain, uh, at the moment based in Vienna, and she did a really strong work focusing on the role and function of the sea, and in particular of the seabed historically, and also uh, it uh, addresses a lot how this potentially might become uh, the new field of accumulation through the seabed mining uh, where different corporations and also nation states at the moment seem to, uh, to compete against each other in order to get the best drilling grounds and this opens up a new round of ecological devastation this planet probably has not seen before and uh, yeah, this is a central aspect of the film, but there are also other aspects. So she also focuses on things like colonialism and things like that. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, the Comitato No Grande Navi. They are active and very successful in Venice and for years were working on preventing uh, uh, cruise ships from entering uh, the 
harbor in the port in, in Venice. Uh, so the locals with their small boats come there and try to block uh, the channel. And uh, finally, I think the local politicians had to give in and at least these uh, cruise ships are not allowed anymore from entering the Laguna. Unfortunately, they are still allowed to go to this more industrial port, uh, which is maybe not so beautiful for the tourists to, uh, to land there. But uh, the fight continues, and uh, yeah, with their uh, way of moving the resistance also to the sea, I think they also show that there is a necessity, a necessity to address the sea also as a battleground. Okay, so um, the first speaker um, will be Sophie Goltz. Um, Sophie is based in Salzburg and in Berlin, and she's the director of the Summer Academy in Salzburg since 2020. It's the oldest Summer Academy in the world. She's also um, the author of, of numerous numer books and uh, the curator of several exhibitions. Um, so, sorry. From 2017 to 2020, she taught as an assistant professor in the new museum studies and curatorial practice program at the School of Art, Design and Media at Nanyang uh, Technological University in Singapore. And she served as a deputy director of research and academic education at the NTU Center for Contemporary Art in Singapore. So, 